a totally different kind of a uh, workshop as far as this particular conference is concerned. Um, a couple of things. This is my first PowerPoint. I normally walk around. I normally have demo demonstration things. I normally bring the books around. And um, I'm sort of limited to a space like this and, <laughs> and this. So we're going to see how the, the mechanics of this thing go. Um, out of the back of the truck, uh, I'm the, uh, the token um, nod to the fact that a lot of you are homeowners, and one of the things I'm curious about is, minus the, my three friends in the back there who, <laughs> who are in my world, um, how many of you are homeowners or are working on small land? Yeah, okay. Um, and it's great to come to a conference like this. Um, I've been coming to them ever since they started, and um, they're fun to listen to, and they're very hard to translate into a home environment and have it be successful because you're talking about how many acres do you have? <laughs> well, most of you don't even have an acre, and on that is your house. So um, this is an, a very practical <coughs> look at what you can do and how to make it work for you. So my background is um, I have been working with homeowners for 35 years. I have a fine garden landscaping business, which sounds bizarre in this particular environment, but is what I do for a living. Um, which means I work with a lot of different sites, a lot of different people, a lot of different gardens, a lot of different um, realities on the ground, let's call it that. A lot of the clients are interested in flowers more than fruit production. Lately, vegetables have been part of the picture too. Um, so that's where my background is. I also have a small farm, so I do understand a bit about the farming background. We do ducks and goats. Um, and who will culture beds, I'll show you one of those. A couple of things to think about. It's very, very easy to think of plants and animals as mechanistic points because you go and you buy them. <coughs> you buy them in small pieces, in small numbers. But when they come and join your home, they're joining your ecosystem. And I'm not sure most of you are actually used to thinking of your landscape and your land and your home as an ecosystem, although in this particular crowd, probably more so than not. But in most situations, most people don't consider that, that their house is part of an ecosystem. So one of the things you might want to think about is every time you're introducing a plant, whether it's a tomato plant um, or a maple tree, you are actually introducing an element into an ecosystem. So it's just something to think through and have an awareness of. Every time you add an element, it changes the <coughs> ecosystem. Every time you take out an element, it changes your ecosystem. Okay? Now... That sounds really complex and sort of high theory, but it comes down to some real practical realities. So let's start off with um, some of the, the first realities of what's happening on your site. Um, I'm going to see how well this goes. So I normally work out for books, not off of um, pictures on the screen. You're welcome to come up and take a look at the books. Um, and I don't mind sending some of these around the room if you're curious about them. You're going to find them um, listed up here on the screen as well. So if you are curious, you can look them up later. All right. Soil matters. You're at the Biodrome Conference. If you don't know that um, at this point, you're really missing the boat. Um, I'm assuming you are at least paying attention to it. So I'm not going to go into huge amounts of depth in... Soil microbiology. Elaine Ingham is here for that. I'm not going to be going into all the different minerals. There are, I don't know how many people here doing that. Um, I'm not doing any of the in-depth stuff on soils. That's what the conference is about. What I am going to do is walk you through what happens behind the scenes in your real world. Okay? What makes your world so very different from the farmers is, without question or fail, unless you guys are on small farms that have not been messed up, you are dealing with completely screwed up soils, right? They are massively compacted. They have had their soil horizons turned upside down. Um, you have either total water percolation because you're sitting on a sandbank, or you have no water percolation because you've got a skinned up clay soil. You have, those are, the, those are your realities. So those are, some of those issues are issues, don't worry about it. Um, some of those are issues that farmers deal with, but in a very different and generalized way. All of you, without question, are dealing with them. All right? How many of you 
have been on your sites long enough to have a history of your site. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that would be my point. All right? So for everybody who didn't raise your hand, these are the kinds of questions you want to start to look at. Um, some of the information you can't get. You have no idea when your house was built if the concrete extra was sluiced into your soil. There's no way to know. But if you've got half your yard and it's doing really, really well and the other half of your yard is not, you need to figure out why, okay? And when you start digging and you start trying to figure things out, anytime you see a major change, that's when you test, okay? So you need to, um, this is also one of the biggest things. How many of you know what percolation rate and capacity means? Okay, um, percolation is the ability of water to move into the ground, through the ground, down, okay? So if you're dealing with a septic system, you always have to have your perc rate checked, and that's its own thing. Um, but for you guys, what happens if you were to take a tin can, take out both ends so that you have a hollow tube, and you put water in, what happens to your water? Does it? Hopefully it percolates, okay? So that percolation is the movement down. The reason I'm saying, and I wasn't picking any particularly, is when people pour water in, if you're on sand, boom, down it goes, okay? If you're on slicked up clay, you can sit there for the next five years and won't move. If you're on a healthy soil system, it will go down nice and slow and easy, all right? This is something you can go home and check right now. I mean, if any of you are local, and I'm assuming that most of you are at least in the Northeast, we haven't frozen yet. We go in and out of freezes right now, but you can go home and check your own perk rate right now. All right? Get a can, put the water in, watch. Okay? Um, it's extremely educational. Most of you don't know what happens when you set irrigation in motion. The reason this matters is if you're doing overhead irrigation, if you're doing drip irrigation, if you're doing um, emitter irrigation, if you're just watering out there with a hose or a watering can, if you do not know what your water is doing, what are you doing? Mm. I can't stand watching people spray the air <laughs> to water a garden. I want to kill them. <laughs> um, it's just a total waste of your time, effort, and never mind the water. All right? You've got to figure out what your perk rate is or what your perk ability is. Okay? Now, this is a cute and funny picture. All right? This is what we take and this is what we make. All right? Pretty straightforwardly. Now, you can, they actually did a pretty good job with this picture, which is why I got it. You'll also notice that there's rocks here, and when the rocks are down into the subsoil the way they are right now, you don't have rocks on the surface. These get capped, but if you were to just clear this off and you were to farm this, these start to move their way up, hence the stone walls all over New England. All right? So this is actually pretty descriptive of what's going on. Now, come on in, it doesn't matter. Um, one of the things to remember is anytime you have heavy equipment on the site and they are doing construction work for you, their goal is to destroy soil structure so that their vehicles can stay up on top of the soil. All right? So their whole goal is not, pen not penetration of water or anything else for that matter. Okay? They want to be able to park a bulldozer on top. Okay? And case in point, this is one of the reasons I, this is great, this is happening in my neighborhood. This is one of our best pasture fields, um, hay fields in, in my extended neighborhood. Just went for six <laughs> house lots. Anyways, um, but what I, this is really useful because the good thing about this particular site is they're leaving the loam on site. Under most circumstances, three quarters of this loam would be sold off and you would only get at most three inches back, but they are actually stockpiling this and it is going to go back on the sites. That's really good news. Okay. But what you also don't understand when you're looking at a picture like that is okay. In the middle of that pile, you've now gone completely anaerobic. Now the outside edge stays aerobic and it will grow a nice crop of weeds, but your inside edge is going to go dead. And so when it gets spread again, you are going to have dead zones that will take some time to re-wake up, okay? Now, you also want to take a look at, oh, what's it? <laughs> All right, 
So this piece, I also didn't realize that the colors would weird out on a big screen. So it just looks a lot better on my computer. Um, can you see this line here? Can you see this line here? All right. This is the topsoil. This is the subsoil. Do you think they're all mixed together and meshed together in that map pile? Absolutely. All right. So even as they're trying to be nice and leave alone, you are getting these two sections manacled together. Also, can you see what's sitting on it? All right. As long as that equipment is sitting on there, you are comp exactly you are compressing it. Okay. You are creating compaction. Now the other thing. Remember, I was talking about. Do you know where the concrete has been sluiced? Okay, this doesn't show concrete, but this is big round gravel pieces right here. This is the existing substrate. This is fine gravel for up against the foundation edge. This is a pile of sand. And if you think those are going to be scraped clean and all of this is going to go back to that, forget it. So when you go to plant a lawn on this, they're going to put probably the equivalent of about four inches of that all over this. And you're going to find that this and this and this grow differently. Okay? And until you go digging with a shovel, you won't know that that's what you've got going on. So you, you're fighting an awful lot of stuff that you have no control over. So the trick is how to deal with that. Okay, you guys can read this. I'm going to talk about it because <laughs> um, I can't stand turning my head back like that. All right. What you need to do is you need to create a grid. All right. How many of you have heard the term site analysis? Oh, thank God. Okay. <laughs> so you guys need a site analysis. You need to plot out. Here's my house. Okay. You need to plot out your east side. And you're going to go out with a shovel. How many of you have done a shovel test in your yard? Okay. Congratulations. Most people don't even know what I mean. A shovel test is you start at the foundation, you put in a spade shovel which has an eight inch bevel on it, okay? And you drive it down as far as you can with your feet. How far did it go? An inch, okay, massively compacted. What did you find? Dead clay. You note that down. And then you go out 10 feet and 10 feet and 10 feet and 10 feet. And you literally grid out what you find. I know it sounds tedious. If you know you're gonna do nothing up against the house, Forget it. If you know you're going to be working in one specific place, work on that first. But you have to do it systematically because you don't know. Remember that picture? Three different piles all within one set of space. You don't know what's underneath. Okay, you can have, um, if you're in an older house, you can have the coal ash. I've had this happen on a site where the coal ash was dumped. Do you know what it's like trying to grow over coal ash? Not, not successful, okay? You have to go up, you can't go down, all right? Um, I've definitely seen the concrete thing. Um, you just don't know, you need to figure it out. And there is no cheap and easy way to do it. You have to do it with a shovel. All right, um, I haven't gotten up here. How many of you have turf grasses, lawns? Are they good quality? You don't count, <laughs> just to be clear here. <laughs> they do what I do. <laughs> um, okay, the point is, your lawn is a diagnostic tool. Most people don't see it as that. Most people see it as either I hate my lawn, I love my lawn, and I have people who are in both camps on that one. They never see it as a diagnostic tool that it is. Why would it be considered a diagnostic tool? Because it covers a wide area in your space. So if you've got a place that's growing really good quality grass, chances are you've got more depth, you've got better perc, perc rates, better percolation rates for water, and you probably have better nutrition. If you have a space that is growing crabgrass at a phenomenal rate and nothing else, then you have a messed up space. Now, crabgrass is not bad. It's actually one of my favorite plants. All right? Crabgrass is band-aid. Crabgrass will grow where nothing else will grow. And it's a C4 plant, pumps down carbon. And if any of you dig up a good quality crabgrass plant, take a look at, most of you heard of now Rise's Fear and the root system and the microbes and all that sort of stuff. Great. All the other classes are talking to you about that. How many of you have dug up a crabgrass 
plan. What do you mean? Everything's working. No, just move two. It was just like this. I'm trying to stay put. It's awesome. Okay. <laughs> I'm dancing in place, but I'm saying put. Uh, crabgrass. Okay. When you dig up a crabgrass plant and it's healthy, take a look at the carbon it is pumping into its rhizosphere. It is one of the best things you can possibly do is to get crabgrass going in places that nothing else will support. Crabgrass will start to change it for the better. If crabgrass can break apart the, the Jersey barriers in the middle of a highway, it can tackle your yard. Okay? And all you have to do is watch crabgrass in the middle of a Jersey barrier in the middle of a highway. And it thrives. Okay? Think about it. Okay. Um, you need to test your soil. Anybody who's in the kind of situation where you're dealing with a homeowner, you need to test your soil. All right? You need to know if you have a heavy lead problem or a heavy, or a heavy um, other arsenic. Um, arsenic and lead are the two big ones. Cadmium can also show up. Um, you at least, at least need to find that out, but you also need to find out if you have major skew outs. All right? Now, I'm going to run through three different slides. This is basically the equivalent of the loam that was in the field there that I was showing you. Um, this is, it's the, uh, it's called garden loam, it comes from the local Agway. Um, we ran a batch of tests through this year. By the way, I use UMass Extension for this sort of stuff. Everybody here will tell you to use Logan Labs, feel free. I think it's great. Um, it's about three times the money, and that's fine. It gives you a lot more information to work with. When you're getting started, get the basics. Okay, this will cost you 15 bucks, all right? And it's worth it to give you the basics. So I'm gonna go backwards and forwards between the three of them for a minute. All right, so this one is the top shelf. And what I want you to do on this one is take a look at this. It's above optimum, but at a rate that is absolutely out of sight. Now, when you have to buy loam, and some of you are gonna be in a position of having to buy loam, get it tested, okay? Um, you can buy in worse than you already have. And doesn't that make your life joyous? Okay? I've had people do that. And they get dark, dark loams because that's good. So what it is is pond muck. And it's anaerobic. And it has um, an alcohol component to it that absolutely nothing will touch. Okay? Yes, you've got to pay attention to this. Also, there are man-made soils out there right now. This is something called top shelf. It's man-made. Now... What I want you to notice, as I said, it's okay for phosphorus and potassium. It's a little high in magnesium, but I've worked with this product before. If you look at, I'm not going to get too much into the technical on, um, on the mineral uh, balances in soils. Lots of other people are doing it. However, when you have a calcium-based saturation <laughs> that is 98, nothing else gets picked up. Okay? So your calcium rate is so high at that point. We all know calcium is good. But too much of a good thing is a real problem. Okay, this is not a decent product. And then look at this one. This is a sterling loam that is a man-made loam. This is a composted, um, composted peat loam. And take a look at all of them. They're all off the charts. Okay. Now, interestingly enough, they're better, even though it's off the charts, it's better. Um, you still have a wild skew out on phosphorus. You're going to have to tweak it. Um, but if you had to pick one or the other of these two man-made ones, you would go with this one. But what you really want to do is work with a basic loam, which has a little bit too much potassium. These are totally fixable. All right? And when we get to the raised bed pictures that are further down, um, this is the one we went with. We ran all the formulas, we adjusted for the bed, and it worked incredibly well. So I'll show you that. <coughs> Does it make sense that you must get your soil tested? Yes. Okay? And that man made, you need to pay attention to. Also, all of these came in quite nicely with no lead. But that doesn't always happen. Okay. All right. Um, this gets overlooked a lot. The only person that matters in the entire situation is you as the home gardener, okay? It doesn't matter what I think, it doesn't matter what your neighbors think, it doesn't matter about anything else. It's your time, it's your money, it's your energy, 
And it's amazing how much that doesn't play into people's decision trees. They all feel like they have to um, match this magic configuration of what's the best to do. Okay, the best to do is going to differ for every one of you that's in this room. That's a given. I've worked, I can't tell you how many people I've worked with, hundreds of gardens, hundreds of people, okay? Every single one has a different issue, a different something. So you have to be in your decision tree. And it's amazing to me how often that doesn't work. I don't know how many of you are doing really decent vegetable, actually I'll ask it, how many of you are doing really decent vegetable production at the moment? Okay. And have you worked out making sure that you're harvesting on time? Yeah, it's harder than you think. It's easy in May to do all the things right to get the garden going, okay? And then, and you can even sort of keep them going, but we're going to talk about how to keep them really going. Um, but then what happens is you have to factor in harvest on top of maintenance, on top of the family, on top of everything else. And it is stunning how often the harvest gets messed up. And the reason I'm bringing this up as an issue is if you're not harvesting, then not only is all your work going down the drains quite literally, um, but you're also not getting what you want out of it, which is in theory eating better quality food in the house. So a couple of suggestions. Pick a day of the week that you do all your harvesting. So I have vegetable gardens on half a dozen sites um, mixed into the, into the flower gardens. When I'm on those sites for weekly maintenance, I do all the harvesting. I leave it in baskets up on their entrances. That's how the product gets used. If I don't do that, it doesn't get used. And I just pitch it. Okay? Well, your guys aren't a whole lot different. So if you can pick a day and you get the production going so that you're harvesting on a Wednesday or a Friday or who cares, <laughs> matter. Um, that makes it a little easier. And you begin to plan. You already plan around shopping. Most of you have a shopping day. You don't shop every day. You shop in a day. So if you can try and match that rhythm <coughs> to harvest, you'll find it's easier. Okay? I bring it up because I watch so much stuff get composted. And it's, ugh. Anyways. Um, you need to see the garden every day. I can't stand it when people get really committed to a garden and they put it down the back 40 and that is the last they see of it. They plant it Memorial Day weekend and maybe in August they go down and see if a tomato ripened. Okay? You've got to incorporate it into your living space. Okay? So how do you do that? These are some of the books that I work with. They're all here. Um, and in particular, this guy right here, um, that's the one that taught me how to work with humans in space. This is how you start to work with lion in space. Um, and this, you're going to see a couple of pictures from here. So from my perspective, those three are the most critical. Um, I have 500 books at home. I have lots more books. But these tend to be the, the ones worth. And this is this book right here. Okay? If you buy one permaculture book, this is the one you want to buy. Okay? Um, I don't mind sending it around. If you guys are careful, it's an old book and the binding is breaking. But what the heck? There's not enough people in here to worry about. Okay? Now, how many of you have heard of what a decision tree is? Oh, good. Okay. This is her version of a decision tree. And what I wanted to note up here is see observation, deduction, analysis, mapping, et cetera, et cetera. These are human learned skills. And if you don't have them, you can acquire them. All right? Look at the things that you need to be able to use your skills on. Okay? So some of this you can't change. Um, your climate. Um, how many of you are not from New England? Okay. Never mind, then this won't work. <laughs> All right. I was going to walk it through New England. So... Um, wherever your climate is, to some extent, you are at the mercy of that climate. Are there things you can do? Yes. And of which managing microclimates is the key one on this slide. But certain things you can't really change a whole lot of. See, imposing patterns. What you're doing as the homeowner 
is imposing a pattern of use on your land, on your space. The more you take control of that, the more you thought you put into it so that it matches your needs, not somebody else's needs. You're hearing a lot of really neat things here at this conference. I've been at this conference, oh, this is the fifth year, for five years, okay? Lots of really neat things, which you can incorporate two or three pieces, maybe, into your life. Because it's too freaking complex otherwise, all right? So you need to impose a pattern that works for you. Otherwise, you're wasting your time. And I watch a lot of people waste their time, okay? And her goals are completely permaculture-based. Your goals may not be, okay? So permaculture is a great model, but you don't necessarily have to get hooked up to that, unless you want to. All right. There are two ways of dealing with suburban urban spaces. You can go down, you can go up. And going down is hard work, as a general rule. Um, especially if you put a foot in a shovel and it doesn't go anywhere. You're dealing with compaction levels um, or just plain lack of quality that is going to be pretty hard to defeat. If you can easily take a shovel, and I do mean by you know, two or three pulses of your foot on a shovel, and you can go down the, um, the depth of the shovel, worth going down, no question. You have to really fight with a foot on a shovel for you to go down four inches, go up. All right? That's how I tend to look at it. Now, one of the things that people tend to, um, a lot of people think that just bed edges can only be hard. Bed edges can be soft. Uh, and so don't get locked on the fact that it can only be a four by eight square. Because correct that, because that's not true. A couple things to keep in mind. East-west oriented beds, sunrise to sunset, have a hot side and a cold side. So you can use that information if you are trying to grow lettuces in the middle of summer. Plant a slightly taller crop on the south side and you have the cool side to grow into. North-south oriented beds are much more even temperatured. So as a general rule, if you can, and sometimes you can and sometimes you can't, you orient beds north-south. Okay? Mine are north-south arcs. Okay? Um, <laughs> And that's okay. That they we have warmer, cooler sections. All right. And straight lines are a farming concept. You are not on a farm. Okay. You may want to be at some point. That's great. Straight lines are a farming concept. Get rid of them. Okay. If you choose to do a straight line because a straight line is comfortable for you, great. In most settings that are suburban, urban you are surrounded by straight lines. And what you desperately need to do from a design perspective to make it pleasant for you to hang out is to curve a line here or there. How many of you, yeah, how many, how many of you have driven down a road and, um, and so road's a, a, a tightly defined space and you see, you know, you're going through a reservoir and you see a road or a path that's off to the edge and it immediately tugs your attention because it curves. Okay? It immediately tugs and then relaxes your attention. So you need to ditch the straight lines unless, and I have worked with a mechanical engineer who if everything wasn't extremely linear in his yard, he couldn't stand to be out in it. Okay, so if you are either married to a mechanical engineer or are one yourself, that's fine. Then you need to use the right lines. Um, otherwise, not so much. Okay, now, going up. My apologies for the green. I did not realize it is nowhere near as green on my screen, by the way. Um, so you can't really see what these are, which is really annoying. Um, this is a tomato plant uh, with purple basil in the front. So this is up on a deck. This is a client, I've uh, got a huge deck, thank God. Um, had a stroke, couldn't get down to the ground anymore, so we literally <coughs> brought his entire garden up onto the deck. Um, and so this is a tomato with beans and, and basil. And then um, these are petunias and a bunch of other annual color over here. And then this is also theirs. And this is kale. Um, and right next to it, only can't, can't tell, um, is a whole thing of herbs. In the back is a bunch of marigolds and um, zinnias. All right? In my world, you mix the flowers in with the vegetables. Um, it astounds me that people still think that vegetables are vegetables and flowers are flowers. In case you didn't know, the plants don't give a flip. 
okay? In the plant world, it's a plant. And in the biological insect world of pollinators and beneficials, the more flowers you have in your environment, the more you're going to bring in your beneficials. And that includes pollinators, i.e. bees and the rest of that crowd, but it also means your beneficial hunters. Okay, if you don't have flowers, they won't come. And one single flower on a squash plant is not enough to bring in the pollinators. Okay, and it's not all honeybees. This one is a different client. This is actually a lemon tree. Um, and that's a cucumber. This is a pepper. Sorry about the, the pictures here. And those are three tomatoes. Up there, color in a moss basket. Okay? She's in her mid-80s. She doesn't really want to deal with her vegetable garden anymore. She is absolutely not giving up, especially the fresh tomatoes. Okay? So underneath the bark mulch, okay, I don't know if you can see it. Here's the irrigation tubing. Okay, so these have um, emitters in each container on a timer. And underneath the bark mulch is a very nutrient rich soil, okay, that we built up. Then we covered it with bark mulch. Looks pretty, don't you think? Oh, so nice. Okay, <laughs> but these guys root down into it, and so they are pulling some of their nutrient load. Now, not all together. Anytime you're in a container, you are totally doing um, fertigation or, or um, liquid fertilizing. But in this particular case, I have them down onto a nutrient-rich zone, okay? So that's what um, going up can look like. Here's another way of looking at it. Perkins School for the Blind in Watertown, Massachusetts. Um, they have a big horticultural therapy program. These are kids with multiple challenges, all right? Now, in many ways, this is a bunch of straight lines because there must be four feet between each element to handle a, an aide, a wheelchair, and a child, all right? So there's some very specific restrictions on this. But I gotta tell you, I've been working here for 15, probably closer to 20 years now, actually. I don't know. Um, anyways, and you would not believe the production we get out of this. Now, every spring, they get stripped down because they never get cleaned up this time of the year. It's amazing. Um, so we strip them down and we remineralize um, using a very complex formula. Come on. Um, and it gets worked in either with a shovel cultivator or honestly with a rototiller. One thing, I use rototiller once when I start a garden, especially if it's in ground and never again. However, in the whiskey barrels, I have this little mantis tiller and honestly, you put the minerals on top, you drop it in, brrr, egg beater in. Okay. Yeah, if you're messing up any fungi that are in there, I totally get it. In another world, in a whiskey barrel, not so much in the way of fungi. Okay. Fungi are critical in the long, long scheme of the planet. Totally, totally critical for high production in whiskey barrels, perhaps not quite so much. So I don't worry a whole lot about the um, using the road chiller and there are 50, 50 whiskey barrels there. And I got to tell you, zroom, 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 I can do it in like an hour. Doing it by hand with a shovel and a cultivator, not an hour. All right, now. What I also wanted to do, um, we have all sorts of different kinds of containers and pull-ins and blah, blah, blah. What I wanted to do is, can you guys see, again, I'm sorry about the green, um, the level of production of these beans? And now if you turn the lights down, I think it might help with the color. I'm going to turn the lights down. Good chance. Let's see what Is that helping at all? Oh! <laughs> okay. Very cool. Thank you for that. See? Okay. <laughs> All right. This is a six foot bed by a foot deep. Okay? Not very deep. But high management, high mineral management. Look at the level of production. That is a cucumber. We get the same level of production off of those cucumbers. Okay? Those cucumbers produce probably for the equivalent of about 10 weeks with enough for all the kids who are in the program to take home to their parents and for her to sell in her farmer's market. Okay? She has a farmer's market that the kids harvest for and sell at. We don't need to go down that road. All I'm trying to say is these are highly productive and they are totally accessible and they have nothing whatsoever to do with that is the top of their bomb shelter. Okay? So this is 
probably about 18 inches of absolute junk. This is mostly crabgrass, okay? So to go down and, and work that soil is not going to happen. And the kids can't get there anyways. So this is all you can do about the guy going up. All right, now, raised beds. Go back to those three soil tests, and we picked for this project that first one, the Agway Long, that showed a little bit too much potassium, but everything else was okay. So you can see, I'm not going to spend the time to go through all of the mechanics. You can see all the pieces that we put together, and John isn't in the picture. We have one of our, our guys. Um, actually, I should take two seconds. If any of you are in central Massachusetts, um, I also helped to organize a Bionutrient Food Association um, discussion group, otherwise known as Growing Bright, flowers and, uh, Food and Flowers. Um, and this is a project that our group did, and one of our guys is, is a mechanical engineer, and so he worked out all the ratios for us, and we were literally doing it quarter cup at a time. So these were actually incredibly well done. Um, beds. And the production level we got off of it was amazing. But what I wanted you to notice was we started with absolutely nothing. The, the ground that they're on, we built completely from scratch. And you can see all the different pieces that we're adding. And then we had rototilled in a huge amount of leaves. And that's the tail end one. These are in front of the library. They had to look good. So they have a very pretty chop straw <laughs> mulch on top. All right? A um, couple of tricks. And you can still do it now for anybody who is um, northeast. This is layer mash, stuffy feed chickens. Okay, in the fall, so right around now, if you have soil that's really lousy, and some of you will have soil that's really lousy, if you will mix layer mash, non-medicated layer mash, into your soil with um, ground up leaves, some wood chip, um, some compost, and go down as deep as you can and let it cook for the winter, you will be absolutely astounded at what you can do the following year. For years, for 15 years, I worked in a nursing home. Um, uh, again, horticultural therapy. But we took four inches of painted wood chip mulch. He got it cheap. <laughs> On sand... And we turned that in one season into a highly viable vegetable flower garden that went across the whole thing. And what we did was use um, the layer mash. I also tested it, found out the minerals we needed, um, but I put the layer mash in. And the reason you're doing that is, again, this causes a huge bacterial reaction. All right, not fungal. Long term, we want fungus. Short term, you need the bacteria. And they did their job. We went back in to plant the following year, and I've never seen a garden do so well. So you can do it lightly. You can do it heavily. The more you can get a layer that, if I say cat's paw snow, does that mean anything to anybody? Okay, never mind. Um, you want to be able to put it down so that you can see it, but not make little um, hills out of it. In other words, it's a nice light layer. All right, it works out, give or take, to be about 50 pounds for 150 square feet, okay, to give you some sort of a feeling for this. The cool thing about the layer mash is it has absolutely everything, including the dry microorganisms that it takes to feed a chicken. And here's the funny thing. Those same microorganisms, those same bacteria, are critical to your soil system. So you're basically, you've got an inoculum going in, you've got their food supply going in, okay, and, man, it kicks. If you go back, if you do this, and you go back in about two weeks and put your hand in, you will feel the heat, provided you have provided them with a source of either chopped leaves or straw or um, wood chip or whatever. You have to provide them food. You can't just, this is not a go home and put the layer mash down. Yeah? Do the leaves need to be chopped? No, but if they're oak, they need to be broken up a little bit because the bacteria, the oak has a shiny leaf on it. And eventually it breaks down and gives way to fungus, but it doesn't particularly feed the, um, the bacteria easily. Any other leaf I wouldn't worry about. Oak would be the only one. And I have no problems using oak, by the way. I use a ton of oak. Everybody says, oh, you can't use it. Ah, baloney. If you need to, you add a little extra lime. Come on in and find a seat. 
Um, so I have no problems at all using oak because they last. For the same reason that people hate it um, is the reason I like it. it. If you've got a highly functioning garden, you are going to burn through carbon like crazy. Um, especially if you don't have a good mulch layer on, and especially if you're not managing your plant material to dump more carbon than it's going to pull out, than the microbes are going to pull out. So you've got to, got to, got to have something that is slow to break down. Wood chips work, oak works great, oak leaves work great. Okay? However, I do try and get them round, um, even if it's just through a lawnmower, which just breaks them. It never really grinds them. Okay? So, I know it sounds crazy, but the layer mask really does work. And I've, I've told this done a bunch of times. Okay, design. You didn't come here to talk about design, you came here to talk about soils. Great. Everybody else is talking about soils. All right, you guys have to live in the space that you're growing. And one of the things I love about this, and this one is coming out of this book. Um, again, be careful with it. I have used it enough to correct the spine. Okay, this is probably the most valuable picture I know of for explaining straight lines make curves. All right, um, can you see that this is a, is a square, I mean a straight line? All right, here's the house. Okay, here's the door, here's the window. All right. Then coming down in here, straight line, straight line, and they're making a curve, and then you have the final curve. A lot of people think that if you have to use raised beds and there have to be you know, nice clean edges, that you can't do something fun with them. And this is to show you that yes, you can. All right? This hopefully will get you out of the mindset of I can either go straight down, you know, or I can go straight over there. No, no. You know, Drop a pencil on a piece of paper, doodle. Find a pattern that you find soothing. All right? I almost brought a mandala book, but that's a little on the wiki side for me. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm into highly practical. This is highly practical. Okay? But if you're into mandalas, find one that you find soothing. Some people are good with um, ovals, some people are good with circles. I don't care. Find one that works for you. Drop a line. And then see how you can make that line that you find soothing and appealing, how can you make it grow for you? Literally, grow plants for you. So this way, it shows you you can do it square, you can do um, straight lines into curves, or you can just do a curve. All right? So it's definitely worth playing around with on a piece of paper. And it's a whole lot cheaper and easier to use a piece of paper and a pencil than it is to go out and try and do it on the ground. Okay? It's sort of like moving the sofa around. By the time you've moved it for the third time, who's ever helping you is killing you. Okay? So, what does working with straight lines and curves mean? Okay, this is actually a um, Brussels sprout in front of a um, tomato plant, and it's um, the main front walkways right here. Okay? This, she actually uses the nasturtiums um, in her salads. This is a rock with a cute little squirrel, and a moss basket of nasturtium. And this happens to be on the way to her mailbox. So on the way back, she picks up what she needs. Okay? The one next one over is a mixture of cucumbers and eggplants <laughs> and red twig dogwood. Okay? Because it's in a pool surround. So what you're looking at is the path that um, comes in and out of the pool surround, and into every little swoop out that I can create we put vegetables, but they're right next to classic shrubbery. And the other one, um, actually I took the picture originally, this was a couple of years ago, um, because it sounded really cool having a rabbit right in front of the, right on top of the cabbage. But we, this is the last of the cabbages um, on this big arcing entrance to a backyard, and we have color all over the place. This is a client who is absolutely, it has to be colorful everywhere, but she wants to be able to eat too. So we have cabbages. Cabbages are pretty. Okay? Cabbages are really pretty. All right? So here's another design component. Okay, this is the um, permaculture we're going around. One of the things to think about is what does water do in your yard? Okay? Um, if you're flat, then water pretty much comes down and stays put. Um, if you are on any kind of a slope, water moves to lowest point. Okay? This should be really basic. 
The problem is water is expensive, water is valuable, your plants need it. You need to come up with a way to keep it on your site for as long as possible. Now, these, this is a permaculture book. Permaculture actually handles this very, very well. They're very keen on every drop of water that hits your property, stays on your property for as long as possible, hopefully until it's all been used by the materials that are on your property and never leaves. Okay? That's cool. It allows you a lot more buffer and drought. In flood, it will still leave your, your property. The reason I like this picture is because it shows you, this is a classic, <clears throat> that's the classic front yard. Okay? And right now, that's a bear to mow. How many of you got slope sites? Okay, so you know what it's like to mow a slope. You know it. <laughs> you usually pay the kids. Okay? Um, and they usually scalp it. The one in the middle is much, much more what you might want to look at. Um, you can see, A, there's a sense between the neighbor that they don't like how, neither neighbor is going to like each other, particularly in this picture. And since I deal with neighbors a lot, you can totally get it. Fences do make good neighbors in this particular set of circumstances. Because what they did is completely convert their front yard. And the reason I'll say that this is really useful is A, it holds onto the water, but B, it also puts those gardens in front of your nose. If you're coming home and you're looking at that all the way up to park in your car in the garage, you're going to look at it and say, oh, oh, what happened to the tomatoes or the beans or the whatever the heck it is. If you don't see your plants on a fairly consistent basis, you will not be able to respond in an appropriate time frame. You know, most people call me when it's a little too late. You know, I've got a bunch of tricks I can pull out of a hat, but it would be nice if you saw the changes in green. How many of you know that a plant changes color under stress? Good. If every hand didn't go up. Okay? Plants do, and they do it subtly. You can train yourself to catch that subtle change in color long before, oh my god, the plant went yellow. The plant didn't just go yellow. The plant was going yellow. Okay? So learn to, to judge it early by, um, now what? Okay. Do you want me to go? No, we got it. <laughs> Okay, that's cool. Yeah, I'm not going to hit that button. <laughs> okay, so this is um, this is off of my property. Uh, I do not have hookah culture beds on my clients because they are a little bit too rough. But for some of you who are homeowners, you can choose this. These um, are based off of wood and then composted materials and more wood, and then they just get covered and they grow. Um, I know, I'm not going to go into tons of details. You can, we can ask, go over questions if you're curious at the end. My point is, this is where the fungi come in. So when the, the whole huge value of the Google culture beds is that they are based on heavy, heavy wood. And over time, that wood breaks down and creates a fungal mat at the bottom of the bed, hugely stabilizing for water and for nutrition, the amount of production you can get off of an HK bed is phenomenal, proportionate to the size of what it is, okay? Um, truly, all of my bed, well, I have one set of beds that aren't this, but I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I have seven HK beds. I also have one to do it. All right, now, making it last. Um, I don't know if you can see this. You've got trees turning color in the background. There's a bit of color coming in here. Some of the ones have already dropped. So this is actually a late, say, late September shot. Um, I think the actual camera thing was um, the 28th of September. What I wanted to do, I know it's not vegetables, but what I wanted to do is show you, look at the amount of color that is sitting in those zinnias. Okay? Now, this is what you can do when you manage your garden correctly from the very beginning to the very end. And you're going to say, well, why do I care about zinnias? Okay, I buy that, at least at this conference. Um, but what you don't see is the enormous amount of butterflies, bees, everybody else. They are using these. I can keep this going until the earliest week of November, okay, on this particular site. It's partly because it's on the south face against the uh, driveway. But still, I have bees and butterflies deep into October on these. And it's the only place in the entire landscape where they can get food. So 
for my money, yes, the client is very happy with this, by the way. For my money, I'm also completely supporting all the beneficials. And I've had to do almost no spraying for um, any kind of uh, pest on this property for the last few years. Okay? Zinnias are an annual. Zinnias are an annual. Yeah, sorry, zinnias. Um, actually, there's a bunch of other stuff in there too, but the zinnias in the front are what I'm trying to show you. Now, these are some of the books that you can take a look at that will walk you through how you keep it going. And I want you to notice that drip irrigation, if you don't manage your water, which is why I started with water and I'm dumping it in here, water is your critical piece. If you don't have water in your system, then the root system cannot access, the rhizosphere cannot function, and you will get nothing. So if you are under maximum drought stress and you go out and put fertilizer of any kind, including the organic milder ones, on your plants, you will burn them. Because they, they will try and uptake water so fast, they will pull in all that other material with their water and they cannot handle it. When they are under drought stress, you can't do it. When they are under flood stress, you can't do it then either. Although, as soon as the flood has drained, you go in and you fertilize. So water is a really big deal. And you've got to figure out how it works for you. Okay? Now, it doesn't have to be drip irrigation. It doesn't... I don't care what you choose. Work your way through it. A couple of things about watering. When does water naturally condense? And you three can't answer. Um, when does water naturally condense in the landscape? Naturally, normally condense. No, okay, it does during rain too. In a in a twenty four hour cycle. Like dew. Dew. Yeah. Exactly. I wanted you to get there on your own without me telling you. <laughs> dew is the key. Because if you water when the dew is falling, every stitch of water you put down in your landscape stays there and gets used. Because the stomata on your leaves open up and will suck that water in, even if there's not enough to get down to the ground. All right? So the critical time to water is just before sun. Okay? Try having that discussion with irrigation specialists. Mm -hmm. Don't get it. Every time I see an irrigation system running in the heat of the day, I want to kill somebody. It is a total waste of your time and money. Okay, in an emergency, if you are hand watering and drenching, fine. You come home in the middle of the day and you find your tomatoes are absolutely flat and they're in whiskey barrels, fine. You go out and you drown it then, I got no problems with that. You put an overhead sprinkler on that, you are totally wasting your time and money. Okay, it's all going to evaporate and the plant will get nothing out of it. You'll feel better, that plant won't. Okay, aim for dew fall. Okay, I set my irrigation heads on the big wide open lawn spaces starting at midnight. And then I work it down so that on the, on the closer, tighter garden beds, which are definitely um, itchier for air circulation, those are running at four, five, six in the morning. Okay, and one of the other things to mention about this, you already know the days are getting shorter. <laughs> okay. It changes, dew falls at different times based on time of year. So you can't just set the irrigation in May and think that that's all you have to do. You have to tweak it, okay? You also have to tweak it if you end up either in flood or drought. So it's not a one size fits all, set it up and run, okay? All right. Um, yeah, I'm not going into all the soil stuff. That everybody else here is doing that, all right? But if you're not certain about what you're doing and or you're doing this in a container, um, you start with a general all-purpose um, organic fertilizer. There's bunches of them out there. Um, and the, some of the information that I have on my website uh, has all the formulas that I use. You want to buy or grow the healthiest plants you can. Now, here's a funny thing. Most of you are going to be interested in buying organic starts, which is great. I got, I'm all for it. A lot of people who grow organic starts actually don't grow very sturdy plants. Because just because it's organic doesn't mean it's actually grown well. All right? Yeah, I know. I'm an asthma. But nonetheless, it's actually true. So if the plant itself is not screaming health at you, leave it there. It's somebody else's problem. Otherwise, you're going to have to bring it home. You're going to have to run it through a nursery system. 
so that you can bring it up to the kind of quality that is worth putting into your garden. Okay? Um, I grow a lot of my own starts because of exactly that issue. It's very hard to find quality, especially vegetable starts. A lot of them are choked out in their pots. Okay? A lot of them do not have enough fertilizer to maintain quality. So you've got to buy the best you can or learn to grow it. All right? Inoculate the soil with microbes. I'm not going to go over it too much, but I gave you three species. Okay? Bacillus, rhizobium, and glomus. Okay? Now, how many of you have heard the word rhizobium? What is it for? Yeah. Um, it's usually the legume inoculant. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Okay. So the rhizobium is the legume inoculant. Okay, and that's the one if you're buying if you're putting in peas or beans, they always say you need to inoculate. That's it. Bacillus are the general ones, um, and they are the ones that are in that um, non-medicated layer mash. So if you were to look at a box of very expensive um, in soil inoculant and go and look at the back list of the uh, layer mash, you can find the exact same group. Because I think somebody was already talking about it this morning. Our guts, the animals' guts, the plants' guts, which are essentially the rhizosphere, microorganisms, they're all the same thing. Okay? It's all feeding through the same system. All right? That's most of your bacillus. Now, the glomus is the real critical one, especially if you're in ground. Not so critical if you're in a container. But if you're in ground, you really need to take a look at the glomus. They are the ones that hold and trap carbon more than any other group up here. Okay? And it's with that that they will start to change your structure. So if you are in ground, if you decide to go down instead of coming up, you need to look for inoculants that list glomus. And a lot of them are now doing it. They've got a bunch of them that are stable um, for production purposes, and you'll be able to find it. But it really, if you ever get curious, just look up glomus species and carbon sequestration. This crowd, you probably will do it because it's going to be interesting to you. A lot of the people I talk don't give a flip. But for you, it's going to be fun. And you can slowly but surely introduce the glomus to your yard and it will begin to do its own job of pulling and holding carbon. Okay? Here's the thing. Plants have a huge potential. Huge potential. And you, as the homeowner, are the arbiter of that. You can either choose to support them to the top level of their genetic capacity, or you can choose not to. And it is your choices that will make the difference. And I'm kind of being a schnook about it because people always think it's the plant's fault. I get so tired of that. Mm -hmm. It's the plant's fault. Like the plant actually wanted to get bought off of that shelf. It was really poorly managed, by the way. But, you know, wanted to get bought off that. And he really wanted to go home with you. And then he wanted to sit on your back deck until, like, oh, my God, I've got to get it in. Three weeks later, no fertilizer. It's me. Okay, so it's all the plant's fault. Okay, give me a break. Just like it's always the dog's fault. It's always the children's fault. It's always, really? Okay, responsibility time. You, you shut up, Kathy. <laughs> You are responsible for the quality of the plants that you grow on your site. Nobody else is. Nobody else cares. All right? So you can have, and I, that's why I've got this, you can have a tomato produced through frost and taste good. Those raised boxes I was showing you, we had tomatoes coming off of those planters the third freaking week of October, and they were sweet. I'm looking at this and going, wow, this is really cool. Then, of course, we got the absolute killing <laughs> Frost and I took care of everything. Um, you can also lose them by the middle of August after their first flush of fruit, okay, because there's nothing left. A plant is only capable of responding to what its environment. It can't vote with its feet. You can vote with your feet. A plant can't. The only thing you can do is withdraw its energy and die, which they do with great regularity. Sorry, I'm in the process of defending plants today. Okay, so this is, this is cool. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's what I was looking for. See this round of very fine roots in here? That's Lisa's hand. Do you see it? Mm -hmm. Those are the roots from the original transplant. Okay? 
Can you see that they, they are of a different quality? Can you see them in there? Mm -hmm. um, can you see the size? And you can see that these just got broken off. Um, we were cleaning out one of my HK beds. These were great tomatoes. Um, and these have just gone down with frost. So the root system itself is actually, you know, we could have left it, they would have regrown. Yeah. Um, can you see the size of this proportionate to the size that's up in that um, cluster? Okay. A healthy tomato root system is going to reach between three to seven feet. Three being minimum, seven being quite nice, thank you. How many of you have tomato roots that are running that? Doesn't count in containers, but in soil. How many of you have tomato roots running over three feet? Good. Okay. Um, for the rest of you, now you know where you can head. Okay? It's worth doing it. The fruit you will get, the flavor you will get, especially if you have all the minerals in place, the flavor you will get, you'll never not do it that way again. Okay? Interestingly enough, try this with peppers. Try it with squashes. How many of you do squashes? How many of you have taken a look at your root systems? Yeah. Okay, what did you find? Pretty long ones. Yeah, they're longer than you think. Okay? So this is one of the other things that tells you that plants, when they're growing well, are going to have a big, vigorous, um, fairly aggressive root system. And they will go and go and go and go. So when you give them small spaces, they will adapt themselves to that space. So when you, like at Perkins, we don't grow tomatoes that are eight feet tall. We grow tomatoes that are about four feet tall. And that's, that's good enough for us. Because they're in, a, they're in a whiskey barrel. And there's nothing else we can do about that. So the plant will adapt. That's what I'm trying to get at. Is the plant is going to adapt to its situation. If you are providing everything it needs, it will give you what it can. If you provide nothing, it will give you nothing. And it's not the plant's fault. Okay? All right. This is critical. Um, how many of you have listened to John Kempf in earlier years? Okay. Um, if you get a chance again, for the rest of you, you've got to listen to him. He will take you through the plant stages of growth. Fascinating stuff. Love it. It's great. What happens is, come to this, within six weeks of planting, you need to be stepping in with liquid fertilizer, unless you are very, 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 very good, all right? Basically, you are going through the initial stages, um, all the way up through scaffolding and into fruit set. So if you plant Memorial Day weekend, and you take it out six weeks, you will find yourself in the first full week of July. How many of you have, how many of you go away for vacation actually around that time? Okay, stunning number of people do. And what happens is they come back and their gardens are already in decline because there's a window when they've grown out based on what they, you've given them. And they go to set their first level of fruiting flower, you know, flowers for fruit production and stuff like that. And then two things happen. One, we usually start to dry down with the heat coming up. And two, they run out of the supplies in the soil. And once that happens, and you get back from vacation, and then you get all the laundry done, and then you get all the kids organized, so it's two to three weeks after that stage that you step in, it's too late. The plants cannot recover. If you step in at that six week window, you can keep right on going, okay? So this is basically what I do. Liquid fertilizing every two weeks after the 4th of July, and then every week after mid-August for the highest quality plants. Now, not everything you're doing needs to be managed at that level. If you have enough tomatoes for the year, stop feeding the tomatoes, okay? If you have enough peppers, stop feeding the peppers. Let them run themselves down. It's okay, okay? You don't need to feed to the end of the season unless you want that production to the end of the season. And that also gets lost. So when I'm supporting those zinnias, those orange zinnias in that slide, that client, from her perspective, she really doesn't care. If, it, if it's in color, she wants it at maximum. So those zinnias are managed exactly like this until about the third week in October, depending on the season. And by the way, in case anybody is curious about whether climate change really does exist, probably not in this crowd, um, I used to be done with most of my garden work by first week of October. I should be planting bulbs today. Um, I'm still working. 
and I've only just got my gardens down, and I still haven't done all the soil mending that I need to do. So, oh, where is it? Right here. <laughs> Actually, let me go back. All right, so this is a late October picture. Okay, granted it's flowers, um, but I wanted to point out the fact that yes, you can keep it going for as long as, as, long as you need to. So here's another cute, cool thing. If you ever have to deal with a wedding or other party, you know how I figured out some of this stuff? I had a client who said, we're having a wedding, an outside wedding, at the end of September. What can we do? And I'm going in my head, okay, what can you do? This was about 15 years ago. So I set about to figure out what we could do. And we started the, the program that I'm going to walk you through in just a second. And they had an absolutely electric wedding. It died literally 48 hours afterwards. With the hard rings. <laughs> but on the other hand, they got what they wanted. Okay? But I put this in. And I also put, this is the, um, the later October pictures also from Perfect School for the Blind. Because it works in perennial situations too. This is a tropical, so it's inside. But this is a kumquat. And I just wanted to show you that manage the way I'm about to walk you through. Um, you can get a really good fruit set. So this is what I do. All right. You notice um, the <coughs> second one is water. If you don't have control of your water, forget it. All right. Do not go to step three. But if you've got your watering under control, I use it's, this is actually. I actually use a slightly different version of this, but these are all things you can find, you can get your hands on, and you can do, and you'll get the results. So that's why I put it together this way. All right, so I use Neptune's Harvest Fish Hydraulic I don't care which one liquid fish you use. Um, so I use that, I use kelp, I use molasses. Please become a devotee of molasses, okay? If you're near a grain store, go and buy the stuff they sell cheap for the deer. It's fantastic, and the plants don't care. Okay, um, Castile soap or now yucca. Now, when I first started doing this, you could not get yucca to save your soul. Yucca is now very popular. <gasps> Wonderful, it's one of those magic things. Great, fine, go get it. It actually works. Okay, so I use, I use yucca at this point. And a microbial soil inoculant. I have it as really dry, I should also have it really wet. So anytime you have surges of water, good or bad, drought or flood, you basically need to step in and replace your microbes, especially in containers, where they don't get a natural repopulation from the surrounding soil colony. Okay? So I put down the recipe for a um, gallon at a time, partly because to completely counter everything you're hearing here, which is by the field at a time, you know, per acre. Well, if you're doing two whiskey barrels, you really need about four gallons, okay? If you're doing a field, then yes, you're talking about 100 gallons and, um, and different kinds of things. So this is, I actually tend to work out of a 50 gallon barrel and a um, sump pump and a hose, okay? But I do a stunning amount with a watering can because I'm up on decks, I'm up in weird places. I'm at Perkins School for the Blind. You should try working with their watering system. Um, you know, you adapt. You do that one out of 32 gallons. So whatever adaptation of this you need to make. Trash cans work surprisingly well for mixing stuff up in. Okay? Because by the end of it, they have handles, and you just into the tomatoes. So you never do the tomatoes with watering can, because they're always going to need more than you can do. So you use your watering can to decant to all the other stuff, then you just dump the rest in the, in the tomatoes. Everybody's happy. All right. There are definitely special... Um, Recipes you can use for foliar applications, okay? I'm going to suggest you use exactly the same thing. It's easy. You only have to have one crate of stuff that you can mix up. The proportions are the same, okay? Yes, you can tweak it, and over time you will tweak it. But for right now, this gets you really good results. So here's another thing. When does the water condense again? Sun. Bingo, sun. All right, when is the best time to put a foliar spray on? Same time, okay? Because the stomates are open. The stomata are the way the plant actually exchanges um, uh, gases, okay? And when those stomates are open, they're on the bottom of the leaf, um, a lot can go in through the stomates. So, and this is where it's great as a, um, 
as a professional, I do not show up on my client sites at 4 a.m. I'm sure I should, but I'm usually um, sound asleep at that point. I'm milking before I go anywhere. So um, for me, I have to wait for Misty Moisty Days. That's the other time that I can do it, is Misty Moisties. But for you guys, you grab a cup of coffee, you mix it up, you go out, you spray, you feel like you've already done the job work for the day, and you get to go off and feel really good about it. Okay, so as homeowners, you have way more control. Okay, that's a huge, huge, huge advantage, and it's not to be sneezed at. Okay? I don't think e things are okay, because they get a lot, and they would get a lot of doo doo. Like, yeah, and so the next best time to do it, but you have to be coming on sunset or after. Yeah. And you have to be in the afterglow. And the reason I say that is this stuff is biologically alive. So you're adding a microbial inoculant um, in these. And if you put, right, they're just going to dry up. And you cannot apply it in the middle part of the day. It's a total waste of time and effort. Okay? So, yeah, my other time, so, like, at home, seriously, um, I'm not a morning person for all the fact that I have to get up to milk. So I don't do this first thing in the morning. I am an evening person. Mm -hmm. I will be out in the afterglow. Yeah. I have no problems putting it down in afterglow. And actually, that's when I tend to get most of my work done on our beds because that's the way my lifestyle runs. So that works okay, too. Um, ideally, you do want it um, at sunup. Um, okay, so I, I wanted to leave time for questions because I thought that would be important. Um, I didn't know what to do for handouts for something like this because it, it's so wide ranging what you might need. Um, I have a whiskey barrel recipe. This is basically off of Perkins School for the Blind. Um, I have a bunch of worksheets that kind of back up all of this stuff. I have basic formulas. Um, on the website, if you want them, you obviously don't need to do anything about it. Um, I'm happy to send some of the other books around. I'm also happy to answer any questions you've got. So I got a soil test done a little last night at the thing, and I've, you know, done amendments, and I have them hopefully working over the winter. And one of my friends um, said, uh, because I'm going to concentrate on um, perennials, said, uh, get a soil test at 12 or 18 inches for perennials. Do you have any differences between what you do with annuals and perennials? So here's an interesting thing. Um, when you amended the soils, okay, this is actually a really good question, because as far as perennials or woodies are concerned, um, it depends on what you're trying to do with them. So if you take a, the soil test and you go for high vegetable production and follow those soil recommendations, you can actually ban jacks an awful lot of perennials. Perennials don't want it and don't need it. They're much, much, much um, more adaptable. That's why you can stick a hosta in anywhere and it pretty much survives. Okay, Not that that's all you're going to be doing. I'm just saying um, six inches is the classic soil test. And yeah, it, wouldn't it be nice if we all had 18 inches of soil? You won't have it. Okay, I'd be very surprised if you do. Even on sites where I've been managing the soils for 15 to 20 years, I'm still, I've got soil depths down to about 12 inches, but that doesn't mean I don't have perennials in there. Okay, so no, I wouldn't lose a lot of sleep over that, but what I would be kind of curious about is what kind of perennials are you thinking about? Well, we were talking about planting trees, you know, fruit trees and stuff like that, when she was first talking to me about, you know, digging the hole and getting the getting the test at that depth for the trees. Now, of course, I'm going to plant other stuff, too, but we were talking about the trees. Okay, so one of the other things to do to think about with the trees is um, you're actually better off going up for part of that depth. Um, so hugelkulture is actually an adaptation. It's not very hot in Invo, but it's a takeoff of the old Middle European mound culture where in order to put trees into um, some fairly snarky environments, they would build up for a couple of years, up for a couple of years, and then put the seedling, the tree seedling, in the bottom, um, into that space. Not into the bottom of the space, but into that space. Because the problem is, you can't amend, you can't dig, you cannot, if your soil is really lousy that far down, you're going to dig um, a space, and you're going to end up with um, essentially a big container in the ground and the plant will eventually hit the container walls. How much, um, if I move, uh, I can't move away. I am you, you can move, I mean, we can see you as far as like. All right, let me show you something. 
Yeah. This isn't what I was planning to talk about, but all right, this is what a lot of people do when they're planting trees. Okay? You dig a hole. What you need to do. Okay? Is that. It has to be a bowl. It cannot be a can. Alright? If it's can, you're not gonna get the, the roots will hit this, they'll circle, you'll get a bad wind and it'll pull out. Okay? The other thing is you need to think about this. You do not <coughs> dig the bottom of the hole. Everybody thinks you loosen it up at the bottom of the hole, which is fine if you're planting a tomato bush. I got no problems with that. You cannot do it for trees. Trees get big, they get heavy. And as they get bigger and heavier, they're going to collapse that weight, and they're going to sink. Do you know what a flare is? How many of you know what I don't believe we're doing this one. Okay, you two don't count. Um, okay. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. All right. So here's a telephone pole. Okay? Here is a healthy tree. Okay? Here is what everybody does. Okay? They bear the flare. This is why so many trees that you guys plant, you guys, that get planted die. Okay? You have got to have the flare at ground or above. How many of you have seen trees root on top of a rock and grow the roots all the way down the rock until it hits the ground? Okay? If you don't think that's a perched crown on a tree, you're missing the rock. Okay? The rock is, is, is there. And the, and the flare is going around to the ground, right? It's better for a tree to be high than to be low. So when you're talking about you're talking about 12, 12 to 18 inches, my reaction to that is, what are you buying? What do you got? See what I'm going at? Yes. Because if you work all the way down to 18 inches and you're only planting a little guy who's you know maybe maybe in a um, eight inch, 10 inch can. He's going to sink into that. You're going to be below grade before you even get started. And your best feeding is up. Okay, so where do plants feed from? You're working around it. Where do plants feed from? Okay, take us out of the picture. Are there any magic to Actually, some people may think there are fairies in the woods. But um, taking fairies out of the woods for the moment. If you're in a woodland setting, how do the plants feed? Surface down. The entire planet runs on top down. All right? And it matters because you cannot bury all the stuff you want down here. That's not the way the system works. And when you bury into the bottom of a hole all of this really great stuff, it goes anaerobic. You can immediately get alcohols down there. It can immediately start to kill your root system. Okay? Or it just goes inert and becomes totally useless because those are not feeder roots. Feeder roots are in the top six inches. When the trees get bigger, it gets to eight inches. At most, how many of you have gone and watched after a major blow and the trees come out of the ground? What do you see? The baskets. Baskets. Yes. yes. In our world, yes, you see the baskets. And for God's sake, get rid of the baskets, get rid of the burlap. But aside from that, the wild ones, when the wild ones blow, what do you get? A saucer. A saucer! Exactly, like the one I just drew. Okay? You feed at the top of the system. So when you're actually planting a tree white, right? I'm gonna start this over. Um, when you're really planting a tree right, you are definitely doing this, this, okay? This is literally the depth from flare to base. And that means you have to excavate what you buy until you find the flare. And I can have just done this this year and every year. When you buy something, it looks very much like this. Look familiar to everybody? Okay, this can be covered anywhere from two inches to eight inches of junk on top of your flare. Okay, we lit I literally just did this, and it was my sister-in-law who pretty much had a cow um, while we were doing it because I said you can't do it until we find the flare. She, you 
you know, she bought these really nice sugar maples. And I'm going, I'm going, oh my God, here we go. We went down over eight inches and then we found the flare. Okay? I, the first time I did this, um, and so I had an eight inch disc. From an 18 inch ball, I had an eight inch disc that was left. At which point, the client is looking at me going, um, really? I said, I can afford to replace these if they don't work. So he'd already dug the holes for the 18 inches. So we backfilled them, tamped them, tamped them hard. He's going, yeah, but you're compacting. He's like, yeah, that's the only time I ever want to see you guys compacting is in the bottom of the hole that you've messed up like this. We got it so that we could plant, and that flare was at eight inches. Those crab apples grab faster than any tree I've ever planted up till that point. And that was what proved it to me. Okay, you've got to find the flare. And then you measure from the flare down. So this depth doesn't get dug until you get the plants. And until the plants are on your site, and until you've taken the top of the burlap back, or the container back, or whatever it is you've got, and you get it down so you can find the flare. Okay? If it's in a container, the same thing. When the guys are doing the container trades, what they're doing is they're taking a container, slamming into a bigger container, into a bigger container. You think they're worried about where the flares are? No, this is all a production model. Okay? So that means when you're doing those containerized stock, you've got to do the exact same thing, and you may have girdling roots. Okay? But we're not going to go too much down this rat hole because we could do a whole program on how to do trees, right? Um, so, does this make sense? And you're then you're going to create, so this is no amendment down here. Halfway up the ball, okay? So it's just a backfill of whatever came out of the hole, all right? You can start adding very lightweight amendment, light levels, into the next quarter up. From there up, to about an inch and a half over, all right? That's your feeding zone. You can do anything you want in there. And that's where I do all my soil work for trees, okay? Because I normally, I will count on this actually getting um, perked down from on top because the system is a top-down system. It doesn't matter what you want it to be, it is a top-down system. Okay, you had a question? I did. Um, mine's about uh, vegetables. Yeah, that's so, nice. It's back to what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. I have uh, three raised beds in yep. my backyard, and um, I take care of the soil. The soil's good. Um, the only problem I've had the last few years is that the tomatoes just take over everything. So um, I'm wondering, like, some best practices and how many tomato plants are appropriate because I've been using the guidelines, you know, every 12 inches, and it's just Boy. the tomatoes just. Explode. Okay, so A, cherry tomatoes do not belong in a raised bed unless you're doing one in, or possibly two in a raised bed. Otherwise, forget it. They are, they are monsters. They will take over the entire bed. Um, so, and that somehow doesn't show up in Square Foot Gardening Book. You notice that's not one of the books that's here, by the way? There are reasons for that. Okay? Um, it's not going to her book. Um, but anyways, so for starters, cherry tomatoes do not belong in a raised bed like that unless they're the only thing. So, like at Perkins, we do one per whiskey bear. You can look at determinate tomatoes, not the indeterminates. And they're a little bit hard to find, but they're tamer. They're way tamer for being in, in, a, um, in a raised bed. The next thing you have to figure out is which do you need more, the tomatoes or whatever else you've got growing in there. And the reason I say this is a lot of people are now doing heirloom tomatoes. Um, and so it might be better for you, since you have limited space, to say, I'm going to go and support XYZ farmer who's doing this really great job with, um, you know, whatever tomatoes he's got, and I'm going to spend my space on what matters more to me. On the other hand, if tomatoes are what really matter to you, i.e. that client who has the tomatoes that I have on the, that nutrient-dense pad, okay, for her, the tomatoes really do matter. <laughs> I mean, they do matter. Fine, then that becomes a priority. So, again, this comes down to choice. You can't do everything all at once, so I pick. Or I try and get the client to pick. And or, go. And for cucumbers, would you say I should probably grow them up? Oh, absolutely. Them absolutely. Them up. Everything goes up. If you're doing raised beds, if you're going up, everything goes up. Everything goes up trellises. And there are cool things you can do with trellises. Do not get limited. 
okay? But, oh, we can have a fan shape, which is good. Fans are nice, okay? Look at what you can do. You can make garden architecture um, issues. You can, how close together are your beds? Uh, they're about, I don't know, foot, foot and a half apart. Okay, if you get a chance to design again, and this goes for everybody who's thinking about design, if you end up doing north-south orientation, and you spread them out four feet apart, you can send your cucumbers up one side, get stock panels, secure them to the outside walls of your two raised beds. Then um, with a four foot rise, you'll get about eight feet in the air. Okay, you can still walk underneath. They'll come over, reach up and pick. And they don't take any of your space out of, they'll take root space, but they won't take visual, physical space out of your garden. That's why I'm saying design really does matter. Even I know it sounds ridiculous to talk about it, but design matters because you can end up with fun places you like to hang out. It's really, really cool. You can mix morning glories in there, and all of a sudden everybody just loves hanging out in your cucumber patch. Um, maybe you don't want that because you don't want people in your cucumber patch, but you know what I'm getting at. There's ways to make it work. Okay, in a raised bed, everything goes up. Everything goes up. Um, going back to your recipe for liquid fertilizer, what is the application rate and the amount oh. between greens and flowering? What a good question. Uh, thank you. Um, so, greens take less than flowering. Anything that's flowering and fruiting is a nutrient hog. Then there's gradations and themes on that one. Um, but anything, so I have this lovely push button watering can so I can meter it. So, what I'll tell you is for most of my greens, um, by the way, it is quarter of three, so if anybody wants to leave, they can. Um, so for the, for the greens, it's basically the equivalent of about a half a cup, maybe a cup per green plant. Okay? For the tomatoes, it can easily be up to a gallon, gallon and a half. Okay? Difference in volume of what the plant itself is going to consume. All right? So, yeah, I would say for the tomatoes, it's a gallon, gallon and a half. All right? And then peppers, it's slightly less. Peppers and eggplants pretty much run the same. So um, per plant on a, on a pepper eggplant, I'd be running maybe a half to three quarters of a gallon, depending on how the plant itself is looking. And if it was really pumping, I'd be backing off away from that. And as far as liquid fertilizer is concerned, I may give you those dates, but that doesn't mean that every single plant gets all the same time, all the same rate, all the same t every application. Because your peppers might be all of a sudden doing everything you need. Whoa, back off. Let them do their thing. You know, your tomatoes are getting yellower and yellower. Okay, fine, up it. Okay? Um, so it's a bit of a juggle. But then you said use it also as a foliar spray as yep. well. Are you like alternating between drenching and spraying? Um, or how are you I tend to use drenches more than the foliar spray. Uh, I will use the foliar spray like on roses when they're really not cooperating with me. <laughs> um, I will use totally use them on tomatoes because you just can't feed them enough. Um, I pretty much don't use foliars on eggplants and peppers because I don't need to. I, interestingly enough, do use them on the greens because I'd rather actually use a foliar on those than I would rather use um, a drench because you can mess those up by pushing them too hard. So, um, yeah, I sort of, it's a tweaking thing. Um, I don't have an easy answer on that. And this is one of the other things. You've got to learn to read the plants. You're going along, your arugula is looking fantastic, fantastic, fantastic. You don't know anything. Oh, uh, wait a minute, just a subtle change of gray. You step in at that point. Oh, they went yellow. Well, okay, but I've already cut them four times. Maybe the plant is running out because it is going to run out. So sometimes you have to, to just learn the plant material. And I actually had a whole part of this talk, but I figured I wouldn't have enough time to, um, to go through how you work out all that information. I have lots that have, likely have houses in them. Driveways, and I'm, I'm excited to do your shovel test, you know, every time. Because, but I kind of already know just from, you know, spending so much time on the property, like where these things are. And I'm also um, putting a design on the property. Um, what, like, what do I need to take into consideration about these different features underneath the soil when I'm designing? Because it's so variable. Right. Uh, how is it? How, like what recommendations would you have to create a, a coherent design? Um, what I would start to do, if, if I was stuck with that, and I'm, I can totally 
sympathize with that. I would start to come up as much as goes down. Because just like the woman who was asking about perennials in the back, which led us to fruit trees, okay? Um, once you can get the system to start to cook, it will start to cook on its own. It will start to heal a little bit. Thank you. I don't see it. I got a whole page of notes. So um, I would start to come up as well as go down. Now, you can't fix everything that's underneath. But what you can do is provide the roots enough space to go that they themselves can survive when you start applying the design. You're not going to be going down very much. You're going to find the pockets where you can, and those are where you're going to be able to say, oh, okay, you know, for this particular audience, a blueberry would go there. And any other audience might be a viburn. See what I'm getting at? So you can start to be able to figure out where you can go. And yeah, those are bears. I've got a couple. Yeah, you just jump and go up, not down. Okay? If anybody is local, um, you can sign up for um, the Growing Great thing, and I'll put you on the email list, even if you never make it to a meeting or something like that. It gets you all of our notes and minutes and stuff like that. What? Um, the uh, layer rash. Yeah. Is that like a um, process product? Like I, I feed a ration. Yep. Like that won't work the same. Right okay, so here's the thing, because you're feeding organic grains. Yeah. Right, which is great. And congratulations. Of which they don't add anything to it. It's just the grains ground. So it's balanced for mineral aid for the chicken, but it doesn't give you what the the manufactured product does, which is all the microbes. So just go buy. Yeah, so go to Agway or wherever you, yeah. you normally buy, and you get their non-medicated layer mash. Okay. And it is layer mash, by the way, not um, pulp growing, because what you want to do is get that extra calcium that's going to combine that makes a good eggshell. Interestingly enough, that's what feeds your soil system. Okay. Yeah. Is that like just your prescription for an all-purpose amendment? Do you choose that rather than drilling down, recommending people drill down on a soil test? No. Um, I'm using, I use the layer mash as a really dramatic band -aid. Okay? So my default, um, if you can, actually, I probably shouldn't put it up here. My default is I work with two parts alfalfa meal, Two parts North Country Organic Pro Grow, one part um, NutriCarb, which is um, Leonardite, one part Azamite. Um, and it's a fully blended, um, we mix it ourselves. Um, yeah, I know. Uh, you mix it with compost and topsoil? Uh, no, that, gets, uh, that goes in buckets to me on every site, and it gets worked in every planting that I ever do. So you said, which is the, which is the default? That's my default. Okay. Okay. So it's alfalfa meal, and if you do nothing else, alfalfa meal is probably one of the best things you can play with. Okay, because unlike the layer mask, it feeds fungi, and it feeds fast. So it's alfalfa meal, North Country Organics Pro Grow, um, azomite, and um, NutriCarb or Leonardite. What was that last thing? Two parts alfalfa meal, two parts North Country Organics, one part azomite, one part um, leonardite. What was the last one? I'm sorry. Leonardite. It's ground brown coal. Leonardite? Leonardite. Yeah, we're going to have to break out of here. Um, okay, so there are cards up here. If you have questions, email me up. Put BFA in the subject line. I won't necessarily get back to you. Um, I will. If, it's in the, if, if that's in the subject line, I will get back to you. Thank you. All right. Thanks.